Good. I think it's working now. Perfect. So we have uh, connected up. So we've got uh, a co-host from South Southampton. So from the network where participants logged in, we've got uh, 13 participants logged in live, and then we've got participants over YouTube. So the way we normally run the CJO is that uh, we, I will be moderating. Uh, I'll give an introduction after which your talk starts. Uh, everybody is muted silent so that nobody can speak over you or interrupt you during the actual talk. And I'll keep admitting participants as they come. Uh, once the talk is finished, what we normally do is we have a question answer session where we direct people to ask their questions through the chat function but giving the participants on YouTube first preference because they can't interact with you directly. And once that's over, then we allow the direct participants to interact with you. Does... That, that sounds fine. There, there might also be another option. I've got something online, which we'll yeah. test and see if it works. If it works, then we'll have a bit more live uh, interaction as well. Sure. That's lovely. Uh, so I'm going to just give an introduction. So I'd like to introduce, so we have a total of 28 participants on the course at the moment. At the moment, we have 16 attending live. We have participants from India, the UAE, uh, participants from South Africa, Kenya. Uh, we've got some of our grid trainees. Uh, we've got a few consultants and we've got uh, our MTI fellows. So it's a really diverse group and audience. We have a few nurses who've logged in from Southampton directly and nurse practitioners again in Southampton who are at the hospital. So it's a really nice diverse audience, but uh, to say hello to everybody and give introductions first, I'd like to introduce my colleague and one of my seniors, uh, Dr. C.J. Francis, who actually uh, uh, was one of my uh, consultants uh, who's trained me and who I've worked with for, I think nearly a, a decade now is the way I would put it. Uh, it's an absolute honor to have him speaking to us today and to our group in our module on perinatal epidemiology it's focused on preterm outcomes uh, and in particular looking at common preterm complications that occur on the neonatal unit, but with a view to giving us an idea about prognosis and how we address those issues. Uh, we have a huge number of conundrums that come to us when these babies develop these complications and clearly how they impact prognosis is something that we often speak to the parents about, but trying to quantify exactly how severe that might be is such a challenge for everybody. Uh, I couldn't think of anybody better to speak on this particular topic, having worked with CJO for all these years. He's been a consultant working in the NHS for 12 years at this particular point and has actually been doing neonates for over 20 years. Uh, he's also got a special interest in neonatal simulation, and he's been running uh, and chairing our neonatal ethics course and conferences for the past 10 years. So without uh, further taking time, I'm going to hand the floor over to Sijo. Thanks a lot for that um, rather generous introduction. Alok is, uh, is a bit generous by calling me his senior. I, I'd, I'd call ourselves more contemporaries, and I think I've learned probably as much from Alok as he might have learned from me. Uh, but be that as, may, as it may, we'll, uh, we'll start. Uh, right, so I, I thought it would be really good. I know it's very difficult with these um, uh, Zoom or, or Teams-based things to get a flavor of understanding who each other are. So I've set up a little online thing, which I hope will work. Um, if you are able to access a mobile phone, uh, I, I, would, I would suggest using a mobile phone rather than your computer for this. Um, you can either use your mobile phone and just scan that QR code, or you can go on to slido.com and put in that number. And, and just to get a sense of who people are, I've asked a few questions. You can choose more than one option. Um, some of them are about your location, some of them are about uh, your level of training or what you're doing at the moment, and some of them are about uh, the amount of experience you might have uh, looking after uh, small babies. Given that Alok has given us a, a couple of hours to do this, and uh, unless someone is, is punishing you by asking you to come here and spend two hours listening to me, I, I, I won't punish you by talking for two hours. Uh, so I think we've got a bit of time to spend getting to know each other. So if I could ask you to just um, start uh, logging on to Slido and doing this, and we'll also try and see whether we can use this to um, ask some live questions as we go along as well. 
So I'll um, give people a couple of minutes just to get going with this. <clears throat> So, so far we have about four people who have managed to uh, log on to Slido and it looks like we have about uh, three quarters of the people based in the UK, a quarter in the Middle East. Um, most people are regularly looking after babies of very small gestations uh, and a mixture of experience in terms of being qualified or in training. Okay, and I'm pleased to see that there isn't anyone here who hasn't, who doesn't frequently look after very small babies. So I, I think we'll move on from this, but keep keep the Slido thing open because it'll give you an opportunity to um, ask some questions as well. Um, and the question and answer thing is live. So uh, when you look on your screen on the phone, you should see a section that says polls and a section that says Q&A. And you're welcome to pop questions in as we go along. As we get to the end of each session, uh, we will just have a look at some of those questions as well. Oh, that is just uh, me showing you how the questions will turn up. The, the test thing is obviously myself. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, as Alok has said, we're going to talk about some of the, the common neonatal conditions that um, flummox us uh, when we look after our small babies. Um, and we'll sp I'm not necessarily going to go into detail about those particular conditions because I think those are each of them are a talk on their own. Uh, but what we're going to really talk about is what we know about what affects the outcomes in these conditions and also what are some of the long-term implications for the babies um, if they contract one of these conditions. But what we'll also spend a little bit of time talking about is uh, some of the prognostic uncertainty that we have when we uh, deal with these conditions and <clears throat> how we actually deal with that prognostic uncertainty, how and how we might be able to think about um, dealing with that. Um, please do feel free to sort of pop questions in as we go along. And, and at the end, I think we'll try and spend a decent amount of time uh, answering questions and talking about these things, because I, I think that that bring, makes it a lot richer than just me didactically talking about these things. So let's let's talk a little bit about NEC to start off with. I think it's 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 certainly one of the more feared conditions uh, for most neonatologists to look after um, extremely preterm babies. Um, the incidence is is reported as somewhere between sort of one and three in a thousand live births. Um, it all depends on on how you stratify it and what, what sort of gestations you're talking about. If you look purely at babies under 32 weeks gestation, then that actually goes to about five percent of babies. Um, under 32 weeks gestation, and it's very much concentrated into those extremely low birth weight babies that we look after. I think what's what's really important to recognize, both in terms of oops, uh, both in terms of treatment, uh, but also in terms of understanding some of the the short and long term outcomes, is that NEC is probably not probably it isn't one condition, um, and uh, is often very difficult to differentiate from spontaneous intestinal perforation. Uh, there might even be somewhat of an overlap between these conditions. Uh, and I've got a graphic there which sort of shows you some of the, the different mechanisms that we think might um, cause NEC. Uh, so there's certainly some thought about bacterial overgrowth, uh, altered colonization. There's certainly been some evidence in, in, in papers that have looked at uh, 16, uh, 16S uh, in stool of uh, extremely preterm babies and found uh, certain differences in the um, uh, the bowel bacterial composition of babies who develop NEC versus those babies that don't develop NEC. Uh, so, and, and, and certainly there is increasing understanding about the, the role of the bowel enteric nervous system um, and its recognition of different bacteria 
uh, and how that might feed into the brain as well and brain development. So the gut and, and the brain are quite intrinsically linked um, and some of what we see in the long-term outcomes might be related to this as well. And certainly there are some factors that affect bacterial overgrowth, the thermochorium immunitis, the use of H2 blockers, and of course the fact that we, we tend to use antibiotics uh, sometimes with, with, with indiscretion uh, on neonatal units. So all of those things can affect the bacteri bacterial, um, uh, bacterial composition of your, of your neonatal gut. Uh, then we have uh, what might be ischemic, osmotic, and other sort of infectious injury to the bowel wall itself. Uh, and again, there are a number of different mechanisms that are, that are thought that might contribute towards this placental insufficiency, the use of certain medications like uh, indomethacin, uh, polycythemia, blood transfusions, um, formula milk, fortifiers, and certain infectious agents such as uh, cytomegalovirus, which I think we're increasingly starting to find uh, when we look for it in babies who've had NEC or other gut problems. Uh, and, and this might be a direct injury to the bowel, uh, or it may be that other mechanisms cause injury to the bowel that may allow bacteria or viruses to, to proliferate. And then I think there is the, the inflammatory response, which I think we all know um, has got a, a significant role in a number of neonatal conditions. And, and certainly with NEC, a, a lot of what you see both acutely and long-term uh, is related to some of the inflammatory responses that we see. And there's increasing amounts of work looking at a whole range of inflammatory mediators that might, that might affect it. So that, that sort of, helps us to understand some of the, the pathophysiology of NEC and that it is multifactorial. And of course, that then sort of feeds into some of the outcomes that we see as well. The other important factor with NEC is, uh, is that we, we do now have uh, improved survival for extremely preterm babies. Um, and as we'll see with both NEC, intraventricular hemorrhage and uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, that increased survival comes with increasing morbidity. Um, and there's a, the Swedish experience of looking, off, looking at um, population-based data over a number of years from the 1980s onwards has shown that over time, if you just look at NEC alone, um, in the 80s and 90s, NEC was often seen with a median age of around 32 weeks. Uh, but more recently, that median age has come down to about 28 weeks. Uh, and when they look at the population cohort, they find that uh, there's almost three times as many babies who are born under 750 grams. So I don't think that reflects a fact that there are more babies being born prematurely. I think what it shows is that these children are, are surviving and we are offering interventions to much more smaller babies than we used to in the past. And so of course we see some of this mobility coming along. Um, similarly, things like uh, spontaneous inter intestinal perforation may also be more common in, in, in somewhat smaller babies. Um, and have often very similar care, which makes it very difficult to differentiate between NEC when you look at the outcomes information. And then of course, the outcome itself is influenced by treatment of the NEC, such as uh, surgery, sepsis, intestinal failure. We'll go into some of those uh, in a little bit more detail. And then lastly, the long-term outcomes are often quite difficult to quantify more precisely. And the reason for this, of course, is that uh, in, in many of the earlier studies and, and many of the earlier work that has been done, survival tended to be the greatest um, uh, interest. And now, uh, as we start having more children surviving, we start looking at uh, some of the information on neurological outcomes. And it's only more recently that I think uh, in every single kind of neonatal condition, including some of the surgical conditions, the, 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 the neurological outcomes are becoming uh, more and more recognized as being an important feature to uh, have as an outcome measure. In the past, outcome measures tended to be much more short-term as well. So that, that means that there's a little bit of a paucity of data in terms of the longer-term um, um, outcomes from a neurological perspective. So let's, let's have a look initially at the short-term outcomes. Um, and I've got a paper here um, that looks at uh, some of the UK outcomes from surgical units that have looked after babies with NEC. Um, it's not actually very dissimilar to some of the other uh, high income countries that uh, have reported data for, 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 for neonates um, with NEC. Uh, so in Allen's study, what they showed was that uh, when you looked at about uh, 230 odd um, infants who had NEC, uh, there's, a bit of, um, uh, there's a bit of sort of variation in terms of how children are managed. Um, there were a small number of children who had no intervention. 
uh, there was uh, about 10% of babies who had an intra-abdominal drain, some of whom then went on to have a laparotomy. But in the UK, the vast majority of children, 95% or so, uh, who had um, significant NEC, went on to have a uh, laparotomy. This is a slightly biased um, um, uh, population group because it is very much surgical data reported by surgical uh, consultants. And so it fails to recognize some of the, the, the non-surgical intervention that babies have. But certainly if you look at the, the surgical treatment that is offered in the UK, there is some variation between this and some of the data that is reported from countries like the US where the use of uh, intra-abdominal drains is uh, often at a slightly higher percentage than is shown in the UK. Um, and cert but certainly my experience of, of having um, had varying surgical consultants with different approaches to this is the intra-abdominal drain is, uh, once you have perforation, is very much a temporizing measure. It's uh, only real utility is often in children who are too unstable, too unsick to have surgery. Um, and so you use an intra-abdominal drain to, to temporize them until such time as uh, they're stable enough for surgery. It is not a, it's not a treatment modality on its own in the majority of children. Uh, but I think some of the US uh, teams do have slightly different experience of this. But when you look at the children who had laparotomies, uh, a, a very small number had a negative laparotomy. Um, some of those cases were, were, sp were subsequently reported as spontaneous intestinal perforations. The, the majority would have had a resection and stoma formation, uh, although some would have had just a stoma formation, some would have just had a primary anastomosis. And then there's a small number whose illness was considered severe enough that they couldn't have a stoma or anastomosis, and they would have what is sometimes called a, um, a clip and drop, um, which is where you clip off multiple segments of bowel that is healthy, resect the bits that are unhealthy in between, and then leave it behind to come back another day. Uh, and about 5% um, uh, would have had such significant disease that you'd open, re realize you can't do anything and you would close uh, without any further intervention. And so when you look at that cohort of children, um, once you, you look at sort of what percentage of those children have those sort of uh, death, um, of the entire cohort, about one in five die within 28 days. Um, and this is um, particularly so in children who have um, um, laparotomy confirmed NEC, but also actually quite an interesting number of children who have uh, SIP actually end up dying within 28 days as well. Um, and of course, as you'd expect, the children who didn't undergo laparotomy had a, had a better chance of survival um, um, if they didn't have other complications. But in this particular study of children who uh, didn't have a laparotomy, they seem to suggest that there's a higher proportion that died within 28 days. And I suspect that reflects that you had children who had perforations who were very really sick uh, and were not suitable for surgery. And that's why they didn't end up having their surgery. If you look at the number of children who were alive and parental nutrition free at 28 days, if you ended up not having a laparotomy and managed to survive beyond 28 days, then you didn't actually need uh, the PN, um, you often managed to feed by that point. And you can see here that a significant proportion of children uh, actually still needed PN at 28 days if they had confirmed NEC uh, and perforation. And very few children actually managed to go home within 28 days if they had, um, if they had uh, perforation. Uh, for those who are not who don't know uh, what a clavian dindo grade is, uh, it's a way of, of grading surgical complications post-op. Uh, a grade one is um, relatively minor complications such as uh, needing some additional medication, pain relief, et cetera. Grade two is things like needing parental nutrition, um, may need more specific medication. Uh, grade three and four are varying degrees of surgical management afterwards. And again, the percentages are probably not quite as important as recognizing that quite a significant proportion of children who have surgery end up having complications. And this is quite important for us to uh, to counsel our parents about, uh, to say that surgery isn't really sort of going to be uh, do the surgery, child will recover afterwards. Significant numbers of children go on to have complications following their surgery as well. So if you take all of that into context, um, the mortality from NEC, about 25% of children with confirmed NEC go on to die within sort of 28 days or certainly before they discharge from hospital. 
Uh, and when you look at extremely low birth weight babies with surgical NEC, so NEC with perforation or requiring surgery, the mortality can go up to about 50%. So that's quite a significant number. But what isn't always recognized is that late mortality is also an important feature of uh, NEC. And in some studies, especially those with surgical NEC in extremely low birth weight babies, uh, this percentage can go up to about 30% of babies having late mortality. Um, in terms of the longer term outcomes, this is quite dogged by the fact that there is a lack of uniformity in how you define uh, poor neurological outcomes. Typically, you define it as severe if you've got a PDI or, or, or an MDI less than 70, but a number of studies use composites of MDI, PDI, severe hearing, and visual impairment. And um, uh, so uh, Prof. Piero from Manchester, uh, as well as others, uh, produced a, 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 a paper not, not too long ago, 2007 or so, I don't think it's changed substantially since then, uh, which tried to sort of quantify um, what these outcomes were like. And what they showed is that if you were a preterm baby um, and you had NEC, uh, you had a worse outcome than if you didn't have NEC. Um, that's quite, uh, I think, uh, self-explanatory. Uh, um, and what they, what they also showed is that if you had surgical NEC as opposed to medically managed NEC, again, your outcome was, uh, was uh, the neurodevelopmental outcome tended to be poorer. And um, some of the American papers have also shown something very similar, which is that the neurodevelopmental outcomes are, are poorer um, and that uh, varies from between sort of 30 and 60% of babies with, with surgical NEC. Um, and if you had surgery for any reason during that episode, uh, the the um, outcome from a neurological perspective tended to be poor, extreme, especially so in the extreme preterms. Uh, what what Piero then did also was then to have a look at a number of of, uh, of meta analyses of various other studies uh, to look at uh, specific um, neurodevelopmental markers such as uh, cerebral palsy, visual impairment, etc. And what this table shows you again is that if you had NEC versus not having NEC, uh, your cognitive uh, and neurodevelopmental outcomes tended to be poorer um, and there's a significance for neurodevelopmental impairment and cerebral palsy if you had, um, if you had NEC. Uh, and similarly, with, if you had surgical management of your NEC, again, you, knew, you had some degree of neurodevelopmental impairment um, and cerebral palsy. For things like visual impairment, it may not have been quite as significant uh, as as one might have expected, um, and then I think from a from a quality of life perspective, um, and, and and this is quite an important one I think because if you look at if you ask parents um, what affects them from a quality of life perspective, even in children who've got neurodevelopmental impairment uh, by objective measures, and we'll come to this in IVH as well. Parental reports of executive function, behavioral, uh, and so on, tend to be uh, less adverse than the objective measures. But when you ask parents what are the kind of things that that particularly affect uh, quality of life, uh, this is uh, often things like uh, inability to feed, poor feeding, poor growth, um, and so intestinal failure. I think from an NEC perspective is quite an important condition to consider. If you look at Purely medically treated NEC, intestinal failure is rare, um, possibly less than 5%. Uh, some reports are, are as low as 1%. But when you start looking at surgically treated NEC, it becomes far more common. And in some studies, it's reported to be as high as 40%, others around 30%. There is some variation in how um, um, uh, intestinal failure is defined. Uh, a common definition seems to be a failure to achieve full feed within 90 days. Uh, although some do use the definition of needing parental nutrition for more than 90 days um, as well. It, they're, they're very similar in terms, of how, in terms of what you're saying, but there are subtle differences in how you might calculate that. Um, and again, what, um, what Nigel Hall from some Southampton showed uh, in a systematic review published last year is uh, that if you looked at um, uh, just purely looking at Bell stages one to three, so including the more milder versions of NEC, Intestinal failure is only present in about 15% of, of children. But if you look at the studies which looked purely at surgical NEC, then that rate goes up to 20 to 30%. And 
If you then sort of subdivide this into different groups, what you tend to find is that the, the younger children and who are much smaller at birth tend to have a greater, greater incidence of intestinal failure. Um, if you have severe instability at the time of diagnosis, so children that need to be intubated at the time of diagnosis, children who have um, significantly lower albumins, uh, needing inotropes, et cetera, those tend to have a higher rate of intestinal failure. The other thing that I, th that I found quite interesting in a, in a fairly large paper from, I think it was China, and I think this, this, this is reflected in, in, in our own experience at St. George's as well, where you have smaller, younger babies who get through the first week or two without developing NEC, and then develop what we, what we call sort of late NEC, NEC that presents in that sort of second peak of NEC, somewhere around four to six weeks of life, those children tend to have a much higher rate of intestinal failure and a much more complex stay than those children who, are, uh, who have NEC in that sort of first week of, of life. So that older age of diagnosis uh, tends to have a poorer outcome in terms of intestinal failure. And the last one, which I think is, is again, sort of something that you'd expect, uh, the more bowel you have resected, uh, the more likely you are to have intestinal failure. And the length of bowel that you need resected to increase your rate, risk of, of intestinal failure to closer to 50% is not as large as you might think. Um, children who didn't have intestinal failure, typically bowel resections tended to be in the one to two centimeter range. Uh, if you had bowel resection that exceeded 10 to 12 centimeters, uh, then your rate of intestinal failure seemed to approach around 50% or so. Um, and then again, as you would expect, although it didn't quite reach statistical significance in most of the studies, if you had uh, a multifocal NEC, uh, there was also a, a higher rate of intestinal failure. So um, I'm going to stop there in terms of NEC and its outcomes. Uh, I think in summary, what I would say is um, the the, the, I think that the, the mechanism of, of illness in NEC tends to have a significant impact in terms of your long-term outcomes. And my own experience seems to be that the children who are relatively stable, who don't have a significant inflammatory uh, response to the NEC, do seem to do more, more well long-term, both in terms of neurodevelopmental, but also your shorter term outcomes, such as your liver failure and your intestinal failure. Uh, but the, the, the more significant inflammatory response you have, the more significant uh, uh, instability you have from an inflammatory perspective, those children tend to have more uh, cholestasis, conjugated bilirubin, hyperbilirubinemia, liver dysfunction, and also intestinal failure. So I'm going to pause at this point for you to ask any questions that you might have around NEC before we move on to bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And I see there's a question here from Yasser. Uh, and the question is, are there any gestational cutoffs or weight below which your surgical colleagues won't operate? Um, I think a simple answer to that is no, we don't. Um, and uh, those of you who live in the UK might uh, remember um, a, a newspaper uh, article a year or two ago uh, of, a, of an extremely small baby. I think it is about 600 odd grams uh, or 500 odd grams um, who was operated on for NEC had um, multiple transfusions intraoperatively and post-op and who went on to survive. Um, so there isn't necessarily a gestation or a weight cutoff, um, but there is uh, certainly a, a greater degree of multidisciplinary discussion around some of the extremely growth restricted babies uh, who have uh, significant um, uh, instability pre-op. Uh, with a view that um, these are not decisions that, that surgeons make on their own, but the surgical team very much work with the anesthetists and the neonatal team to try and decide which children should be operated on and which you don't operate on. Um, and the way that we operate at St. George's is very much in that sort of uh, multidisciplinary discussion with the with no one team particularly sort of taking the, the, the responsibility for making the decision to operate. Um, I hope that helps to answer your question, yes, sir. Any, any other questions around NEC before we move on? So there's a question from uh, Santan, uh, who is one of our MTI trainees. And uh, the question that he's got is, uh, a lot of uh, people make a diagnosis of NEC within the first two weeks of life. And that is, you know, the more preterm you are, the, I think he, he, he's kind of alluding to the fact that you should develop symptoms late. Now, the question is, is that NEC or is that something else? Or is that a spectrum of NEC? And the other question he had was, I mean, clearly 
the differentiation between SIP and NEC and outcomes, that's not very well differentiated. So for your local data, are you considering them separate entities or the same entity? Uh, okay, two, two very good questions. Uh, I think the first question, um, Santan, is uh, because NEC, I think, is, is, is a multifactorial, multidimensional illness, with possibly some being more of an of a infective process, some being more purely inflammatory, some being more vascular. Um, it's very possible that you're dealing with different mechanisms of injury producing a similar clinical picture at different points. And that's why you have that sort of multimodal distribution uh, in terms of the incidence. And, and we certainly do see that there's a, a group of children who have a presentation that we would call NEC because of how it presents in terms of abdominal features, x-ray features, et cetera, which tends to sort of peak in that first week of life, which I think we would still call NEC. Uh, and then a somewhat different presentation, um, but with very similar radiological and clinical manifestations, which tends to arise somewhere around the sort of fourth to sixth week of life. Um, and I think they're both still this condition that we call NEC, but the reason why those children get the, the illness in those two periods may be somewhat different, and that may well have a difference in terms of outcome. And, 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 and again, as I said before, my experience has been that it's that later NEC that tends to be often somewhat more fulminant, more rapidly progressive, and the ones that tend to have a, a, a poor or longer term outcome. Um, in terms of your second question, uh, which I think um, was around SIP and, and NEC and the differentiation between the two, I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, we've, we've certainly had children who clinically have looked more like an SIP, who uh, have an incidental presentation where you do an X-ray for some other reason and you find, well, hang on, there's, there's perforation here. You can see gas in the, in the free gas in the abdomen. The child is, is relatively stable from a physiological perspective. Sometimes they're not even intubated. As I said, can sometimes be an incidental finding. But we have been surprised even in some of those children where at operation, the surgeon has felt actually this looked more like NEC than it did uh, SIP. And, and, and the reverse has happened where uh, we've clinically thought, gosh, this looks very much like NEC. Uh, abdomen is shiny, red, distended. Uh, there's more clinical instability than you would have expected with an SIP. Uh, but actually, when the surgeon goes to theater, they go, well, actually, the bowel itself, the rest of it looked fine. This looks very much like a blowout kind of lesion with SIP. The location is correct for SIP. But the child may be more, more unwell. And what you find in a lot of the papers is that that conundrum in terms of the diagnostic features, but also the surgical features, mean that it's very difficult to clearly separate out your SIP patients from your NEC patients. So when, when it comes to the, our outcomes, um, where it is absolutely clear, both clinically and surgically, there is a spontaneous intestinal perforation, we record it as such, and we don't um, consider that as part of our NEC outcomes. But where there's more uncertainty, uh, we tend to sort of say it's suspected NEC, and we tend to consider those as part of our NEC outcomes. Um, and and it, it is challenging, and, and uh, there has, uh, we have, a, we have a Friday morning surgical MDT where the surgeons and the neonatologists sit down together to have a chat. And uh, also not common, there, there are times when there are some spirited discussions as to whether this was NEC or whether this was spontaneous intestinal perforation. As you'd expect, uh, the surgeons often win because they, they tend to be louder. Peter, just one other question that we've got, and this is from Savitri, uh, who is working in Jaipur in India. So probiotics have, I mean, a lot of places like Canada using it routinely, have you implemented it or thought about it? And I mean, the question is obviously when and how? I think that's a very good question. Uh, I would add a third one to it besides the when and how, uh, a third, which is what? Uh, probiotics, uh, much like NEC, is, is not a single product. It's not like ibuprofen where you can say, well, this is ibuprofen and this is indomethacin. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uncertainty as to which bacterial strains may produce benefit. Um, the, I think that one of the larger and better studies that have looked at this was the PIPS study, which uh, used a specific strain of bifidobacterium, uh, very large, very well-conducted study. Um, and despite that 
it being a very well conducted study, I think there was still some cross contamination uh, between children who were on the control arm and children who were in the intervention arm. A number of the other studies that have looked at probiotics have been uh, uh, have, have had significant issues with cross contamination on neonatal units uh, with uh, uh, the control groups uh, also getting a, a degree of the probiotic bacteria. The PIP study showed absolutely conclusively that uh, that particular strain of uh, bacteria provided no benefit in terms of NEC and provided no benefit in terms of late onset sepsis. Of course, a number of meta-analysis more recently have shown uh, that there is some benefit from um, uh, probiotics and specifically certain lacto lactobacillus strains. I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm still uh, somewhat unconvinced uh, and I'm unconvinced because I think the meta-analysis or the meta-analysis itself was very good uh, a number of the studies that were included uh, had significant issues, both in terms of bias, but also in terms of contamination or did not look at contamination as a, as a, as a outcome as well. So for that reason, we've, we've gone backwards and forwards on the probiotic issue for, for a number of years, um, and we've not implemented probiotics as a routine of care. However, more recently, we've looked at uh, a particular product, um, which one of our colleagues is quite keen on, uh, which, show, which is a particular strain of lactobacillus, I think, which seems to suggest there is some, some benefit. Um, and I think we are in the process of uh, speaking to our pharmacy and our medicines uh, board to approve its use because it's not an approved drug as such. It's fairly expensive. Uh, I think this particular preparation, I think we've estimated if we were to use it for all our high risk uh, group of children will cost us uh, somewhere in the region of uh, ten to twenty thousand pounds per year, uh, so that's you know that's that's not cheap at all, uh, even for the UK. Um, but we've 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 as a consultant team agreed to start its use because I think we're fairly convinced that even if it doesn't provide any benefit, it doesn't provide produce any harm to children. Uh, and, and considering how devastating a condition this is, even if there is some marginal benefit, uh, it may be worth trying. But we're going to be doing implementing it uh, while at the same time looking at our uh, NEC and other condition incidences over the period pre and post implementation to see whether we can see a difference. And I suspect we, you know, we would need to use it for five to five to eight years at least for us to be able to start seeing any difference. So that's that's where we are with probiotics. Uh, I don't think the story on probiotics is is that clear in terms of benefit, uh, but I do think that uh, all the evidence does show that it doesn't cause any harm. Uh, if you uh, use appropriately prepared preparations of probiotics. That's really helpful. Uh, Cedar, you can carry on. Okay, so we'll move on now to, to bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Uh, I don't expect any of you to sit and, and look through this entire chart. I think it's trying to show you that um, over the years, the, the definition of what bronchopulmonary dysplasia has certainly changed. And the reason why it's changed is that Again, a bit like um, uh, NEC, the condition probably has evolved as uh, we've started looking after smaller and smaller babies and the use of surfactant, et cetera. Um, and uh, there is a consensus now in terms of the National Institutes of Child Health of what constitutes NEC. And I think this consensus improvement, even if we don't necessarily all agree with it, uh, I think this consensus is, improve, is important in terms of being able to report uh, your, your BPD rates and being able to make comparisons and benchmark yourself against other, uh, other units. Um, and from a, near, from a UK perspective, um, all neonatal units um, provide information into what's called the National Neonatal Audit Program, NNAP. Um, and N NNAP allows UK neonatal units to benchmark ourselves on the rate of, uh, of BPD in children under 32 weeks. And the NNAP definition uh, is that you have mild BPD if you have uh, respiratory support in the form of ventilation, CPAP, BiPAP, uh, high flow oxygen, or any oxygen on day 28 uh, plus and air at 36 weeks corrected gestation, or the time of discharge if you're discharged before 36 weeks. And you're considered to have significant BPD if you were on respiratory support uh, at day 28 plus. Um, and you were still uh, receiving respiratory support at 36 weeks current gestation or the time of discharge. Um, and I think that the data on BPD is quite interesting. So on the left-hand side, uh, I have uh, our St. George's data compared to uh, our network dashboard. And what's quite interesting to see is if you look at 2010, um, 
the our our NAP data showed about 30% BPD. The network was showing about 32%. And between 2010 and 2018, our percentage of BPD has, has sort of slowly gone up. Um, and certainly within our network, other units have shown pretty much the same effect as well. Um, and, and this is actually mirrored by the, the international data, looking at data from about 2007 to 2015, uh, which looks at data available from a number of different um, neonatal databases, the, the Swiss one, the Canadian one, uh, Australia, New Zealand, the UK, um, there's an Italian one, uh, Japanese, et cetera. And, and what all of these show, uh, with exception of uh, the, the Canadian one, uh, the dark black line is the composite outcome, including BPD, and the gray one is the composite outcome without BPD. And in most places, the BPD rates have gone up. Uh, the Italian uh, outcomes have generally gone down a little bit and uh, BPD has gone down with that. But what's interesting is Canada is probably the only place where they've shown a very consistent reduction in BPD, even as their outcomes have improved. Um, and, and I'll come, come on to that in, in, a, in a little while as to what, why that might be the case. Uh, but certainly the, this, this uh, trend that we've seen of increasing BPD over time seems to be very similar to, to what's reported elsewhere. And, and this just shows this a little bit more graphically. Um, if you look at uh, two gestational age bands, the baby is born between 23 and 26 weeks, and those that are born between 26 and 29 weeks. Um, our um, outcome in terms of survival has improved over time uh, in both cohorts, but possibly slightly better in, uh, improvement in the in the sort of 26 to 29 weekers. Uh, and in 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 the 26 to 29 week cohort, the BPD rate has gone up quite substantially. With the uh, 23 to 26 weekers, the BPD rate uh, is around 80 plus percent. It has gone down maybe a little bit, but I, I, I would not consider that to be a significant. We probably call that more or less static. But what is what is concerning is that this group here is where the rate has significantly shot up, but it has come with improved survival. Um, and uh, you know, you may consider whether that's an inevitable uh, feature of of allowing more babies to survive. Um, I'm not so sure about that. Um, but one of the things, you know, in, informally what you do is you ask your colleagues, what are your experiences? And um, one of my colleagues spoke to um, a, a colleague of ours who's now working uh, in a hospital elsewhere in the UK, whose BPD rates are significantly better than ours. And when we asked him after he'd been in the new hospital for, for a little while, you know, what do you see them doing that's different to what you've done at St. George's while you were with us? His answer was, well, actually this hospital that I'm working in now, we have fewer babies surviving than, than St. George's does. And so our BPD rates are better, um, suggesting that it's, it's more to do with survival than, than to do with uh, anything else from a, from a management perspective. I'm not sure that's entirely true and I'll come on to why, why, why that might be the case. Um, but the next question then that, that leads on from that sort of gestational thing is, can we predict uh, which babies uh, that we look after might go on to develop BPD if we uh, just avoid looking at purely gestation alone? And there's some really in, you know, good bits of data out there. There's the Japanese cohort of almost 20,000 babies born at between 22 and 27 weeks gestation between 2003 and 2016. So this is a, a national cohort. Uh, these national cohorts can be quite good because they allow you to even out some of the variations in practice between different hospitals. And it's quite a significant uh, time period they've looked at. And, and, and I think this is quite a, quite a useful paper to look at because um, generally speaking, I think there's an impression that uh, the Japanese do quite well in terms of keeping their very, very small and preterm babies alive. And what they found is that uh, the BP BPD seems to be associated with um, needing more than four weeks of supplemental oxygen or invasive ventilation at the start. Uh, if you had a birth weight less than 750 grams, uh, you had a much higher rate of BPD. If you were small for your gestational age, if you had more than or equal to four weeks of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, uh, if you had chorioamnionitis and you were born at less than 26 weeks gestational age. Uh, I think these are, these are quite important clinical features that it's important to recognize. And certainly I think uh, it mirrors what, uh, what our experience is as well. And certainly what I've um, experienced from working in different units that seem to have uh, 
different rates of babies that are born very small and, and uh, small for gestational age. The babies who, who grow less well in utero and have significant uh, growth restriction uh, tend to do relatively better short term from a respiratory perspective, but seem to seem to get stuck uh, on, on non-invasive respiratory support for a much longer period of time and tend to have uh, more significant BPD than those children who are born at a more appropriate gestational age. And certainly those babies that have chorionitis uh, certainly have tend to do worse. But what I've also found to be quite interesting is even in those children that were born at an appropriate age and size and were doing quite well from a respiratory perspective, if they had a significant pro-inflammatory condition such as bad NEC, we've seen a number of those children go from doing reasonably well from a respiratory perspective to getting fairly significant and progressive uh, lung disease uh, following their inflammatory process as well. And this seems to be borne out a little bit by what the Japanese have seen as well. The other two things that I think are quite an interesting one is what they found was that if you were born in a center that had relatively small number of cases per year, um, then uh, you tended to have higher rates of BPD. And if you had uh, PDAs that needed to be treated, then again, that tended to increase your rates of BPD. I think it's, it's useful to think about this one about less than 20 cases per year. That, that, that's reflected very similarly in uh, the UK guidance around um, uh, neonatal practice and the recognition that actually we have a number of level three tertiary units that have less than 4,000 respiratory days and uh, look after relatively small volumes of very small babies. And, and I think it, it's sort of, you know, it's something that we've recognized in the UK as being an important factor, but because of the geography, we still have a number of level three units that don't look after significant numbers of children uh, who are born very small. Uh, so I think that may be something that we might have to think about addressing in the future. Um, the other thing that was quite important was that the, the, the median duration of invasive ventilation shortened during this 2003 to 2016 period. So you know, we've had significant advances in how we provide non-invasive ventilation, how we provide surfactant treatment. And there's certainly been uh, in the last few years, I think a, a bit of a clamor around uh, less or minimally invasive surfactant delivery with a view that this is a means of uh, reducing lung, lung related morbidity for children. And what the Japanese data shows is that um, although the median duration of invasive ventilation shortened in this study period of 2003 to 2016, the BPD rates actually went up. So it may be that it's not purely the invasive ventilation, uh, but more the, the level of prematurity that makes a difference. Uh, and this is also seen uh, in some of the US data, which is a slightly smaller cohort of babies from a, from a, a fairly large uh, neonatal center, uh, 317 odd babies born at 23, 27 weeks, uh, 2011 to 2017. So slightly smaller, but contemporary sort of period. And what they also showed is that uh, protective features for BPD were being a higher birth weight or being a female gender, uh, but uh, a predictor for moderate or severe BPD was needing needing more than two doses of surfactant. Uh, and I think this is, you know, whether that's a predictor or whether it's a feature of a child who's got more significant lung disease is, is, a, is, a, is an interesting point to think about. In my own experience, uh, giving more than two doses of surfactant isn't often uh, beneficial. Uh, you don't see that sort of improvement. Uh, I think giving more than two doses of factor is often a sign of how desperate we are um, in a child who has got significant lung disease. Um, and I think that's probably matched by what they showed uh, in the other sort of fact feature they looked at, which is that if you needed more than 40% oxygen uh, on day one of life, that was a predictor for moderate or severe BPD. Um, similarly, if you had uh, more than five cumulative days of being in oxygen in the first 14 days of life, and if you had cumulatively more than seven days of mechanical ventilation in the first 21 days after birth, uh, that too was a predictor of moderate or severe BPD. The more than two blood transfusions, I think is an interesting one. Um, there's certainly an increasing recognition that blood transfusions can be associated with triggering of inflammatory cascades. And we've seen some association with blood transfusions in, in NEC as well. Um, and again, whether this is the blood transfusion uh, causing BPD because of that sort of inflammatory response, or whether it might be a reflection of, of greater uh, severity of, of overall illness in these children, I think is a little bit more difficult to work out. 
But certainly all these features are things that you can look at when you're looking after a child. And if you see all of these things, I think you, you have a much better ability to talk to the parents about what to expect in terms of these short-term mobilities around short and medium-term mobilities in terms of BPD. I think fundamentally, you know, we can predict all of these things and we can look at all of these different features, but what parents often want to know is, well, what does that mean for my baby? Um, and I think the important thing here is that developing significant BPD is known to contribute uh, not just to mortality, but actually long-term mobility for babies as well. And, and that is influenced to a larger extent uh, by the development of additional comorbidities such as, such as pulmonary hypertension. And what, uh, what's been shown is that the combination of pulmonary hypertension with chronic lung disease or BPD is particularly deleterious for children. So um, this combination is seen in about 20% of extremely preterm babies. But that combination of pulmonary hypertension and uh, it, sorry, the presence of pulmonary hypertension is seen in about 50% of children with severe lung disease. And I think that is, that is broadly reflected by what we've seen ourselves. Um, and when you look at uh, the mortality in the association of BPD with pulmonary hypertension, the mortality tends to go up to about 40 or 50% if you have significant pulmonary hypertension with BPD. And what's particularly important, I think, and, and this is sometimes not recognized and, and I think highlighted to parents adequately, is that, that a, a significant proportion of that mortality, and I think in some studies up to about 30% of that mortality, doesn't happen on the neonatal unit. It happens after discharge, during uh, infancy, late infancy, up to about the sort of age of two in the community. Uh, and this often comes as a surprise to families um, uh, uh, that I've spoken to when, when the children have come in later on with significant uh, illness uh, and been uh, readmitted to the PICU. Um, mild and moderate BPD though, so not the severe BPD with the pulmonary hypertension, et cetera, but if you have mild or moderate BPD, they aren't particularly good predictors for later poorer outcomes. Um, and when you look at sort of extremely preterm babies, uh, the use of postnatal corticosteroids uh, is associated with major disability, independent of mild or moderate that stage of BPD. But what seems to be a much stronger predictor of poor neurodevelopmental outcomes in children who have BPD tends to be the use of prolonged positive pressure support, uh, the presence of grade three or four IVH, which we'll come to in a minute, or being discharged at more than 43 weeks of uh, postmenstrual age. So. Uh, I think that's probably a reflection of the fact that the child has got particularly significant lung disease that you can't discharge them beforehand. Um, following discharge, what can parents expect? Well, um, about a third of babies born before 32 weeks of BPD are readmitted in the first year of life. Um, but this seems to be uh, less associated with, with just having home oxygen but more associated with the child having been born at an early gestational age, being a baby with a, a, a boy, having a higher grade of bronchopulmonary dysplasia and having had surgical NEC. If you don't have those other risk factors, but you have milder to moderate BPD and you discharge home on oxygen, then uh, you're, the fact that you've gone home on oxygen doesn't seem to suggest that you're, you're more likely to be readmitted. And that's important, I think, in terms of counseling families because one of the things that families often worry about in terms of going home with oxygen is that I'm going to end up needing to come back into hospital. And, and some of the studies that have shown uh, earlier discharge home with home oxygen support have not shown an increase in readmission in those children that have gone home earlier compared to historical cohorts who were kept in hospital on oxygen. Um, but those other features may, may predict um, the child being readmitted to hospital. The average number of readmissions seems to be somewhere between sort of two and three. Um, and uh, that seems to decline over time. What does seem to sort of um, have a significant impact though is that children with uh, BPD of any severity tend to have more profound uh, illness with respiratory viruses and particular things like RSV. Um, and uh, that uh, you know, gives some credence to uh, us trying to provide prophylaxis against RSV for some of the sort of children with milder uh, BPD that we don't always give um, um, RSV prophylaxis to. The other important illness that I think parents need to be aware of is an, a disease that is very similar to asthma. It, it presents in a similar kind of way. Um, and there is a certainly a, a greater incidence of that kind of asthma-like disease in children who are discharged home with BPD. 
Interestingly, again, there doesn't seem to be a strong association with the severity of BPD uh, and this asthma-like disease. And again, there doesn't seem to have been um, significant modifiers to this uh, in terms of using medication to try and manage uh, that disease as well. And then lastly, as I alluded to earlier, much like NEC, uh, there is a significant um, rate of children who fail to thrive and who fail to uh, um, uh, take adequate quantities of enteral food. And again, this is often described by parents independent of the BPD and home oxygen to be a significant uh, factor in their quality of life after discharge. So I think that, that sort of gives you a flavor of, of how challenging it can be to manage both short and long-term um, um, children with, with BPD. But I think it's, it's, it's although we, you know, I've, I've said that, that the increased rates of BPD seems to be associated with uh, improved survival of these really small children, I think it's somewhat defeatist to think that we can't uh, improve those outcomes. And this is where some of the Canadian experience uh, comes into place. I said earlier, if you look at that, that graph, that the Canadians seem to have significantly improved their chronic lung disease rates more than the UK and other countries have, despite improving survival of these extremely preterm babies, which then sort of has led a number of people to explore what might be behind that improvement in outcomes. And what's interesting is that uh, Canada over the last 15, 20 years has had a program of continuous quality improvement on their neonatal units. But what's a bit of a challenge is that that continuous quality improvement program has been very local. So individual units have had their own individual quality improvement programs focusing on those particular areas that they thought was important. So different units are focused on different areas. And, and because of that, it's been quite difficult to try and uh, find a uniform uh, uh, reason why the Canadian chronic lung disease rate has come down. But what it does seem to show is that improving that overall quality of care for babies and reducing things like line infections, NEC, improving feeding, improving growth, all seem to reduce that incidence of BPD. Um, and so again, much like NEC, the, the, the severity of BPD can be modified by a number of other factors uh, that we can control, even if we can't control the lung development in itself. But what, what, what this, this other Canadian study tried to show, tried to look at is, once you've developed BPD, can you improve the outcome for children with significant BPD by undertaking a number of interventions? And so what this team did is they looked at children who, uh, they were, well, this team was referred children at 36 weeks current gestational age, who had been diagnosed with significant B, uh, BPD. And they did a number of different interventions such as uh, specific and, and prescribed respiratory management led by uh, the bronchopulmonary dysplasia team, assessment of cardiac um, uh, status, uh, looking specifically at things like pulmonary hypertension, undertaking management of pulmonary hypertension with sildenafil and other drugs if appropriate, um, uh, looking at improving weight gain by involving gastroenterologists and nutritionists early. And what they showed is that by doing this, they were able to improve the weight gain. Um, so if you look at weight gain, Z scores, at discharge, uh, the children who had this uh, degree of MDT input, uh, their Z scores were at uh, minus 0.8 compared to minus 1.35 pre-intervention. And they also managed to improve the length. So showing you that sort of mean uh, lean body mass was, was improved. Um, and this was even in sort of moderate BPD as well. And uh, what they showed also is that they were able to discharge those children slightly earlier, so around 10 weeks after uh, intervention was started, than in the pre-intervention era where the postmenstrual age of discharge tended to be more in the region of uh, around 50 weeks, so you know, around four weeks less, less in hospital. That's you know, obviously quite significant from a family's perspective. Um, and it's obviously quite important from an from a economic perspective. If you compare those children with severe BPD to the children with sort of more moderate BPD, you make their growth more similar to moderate BPD, but their length of stay is still, is still higher and the sort of mean length of stay in hospital is still higher. But if you then look at some of the other features such as whether they discharged hormone oxygen, uh, whether they have a tracheostomy, you can see that children with more severe uh, uh, BPD tended to have tracheostomies more. Uh, 
but by having a multidisciplinary input in place, you're able to, to halve the number of children, roughly, who got tracheostomies. And you were also able to influence things like pulmonary hypertension um, and, and the development of progressive pulmonary hypertension. Things like reflux couldn't really improve, things like asthma not quite reaching statistical significance, although maybe the trend towards improvement. But interestingly, use of certain medications to manage that sort of asthma condition didn't really change, although there was a trend towards improvement in terms of the diagnosis. Uh, things like using gastro uh, gastrostomy tubes and feeding problems. Gastrostomy tube use did not change particularly between the intervention group and the non-intervention group and was still significantly higher than in moderate PPD. But you, they were able to improve that sort of failure to thrive and feeding problems. Um, so although there's a trend towards improvement in pulmonary hypertension, it, it wasn't statistically significant, but I think there's still a, a trend towards improvement. Um, but they showed that there was no real change in readmission rates in the first two years of life. Um, although uh, there may be a number of different reasons why that was the case. And the, and the impression was that there might be some uh, differences in why children were readmitted as opposed to uh, the pre-intervention. So I'm going to stop there in terms of uh, improving outcomes of BPD. I haven't talked very much more specifically about BPD and neurodevelopmental outcomes, uh, partly because um, I think there's a consistent uh, message that uh, children who have more severe BPD tended to have poorer neurodevelopmental outcomes. Children with sort of milder and moderate BPD, their neurodevelopmental outcomes were more in line with any other conditions that they had and their degree of prematurity rather than directly related to BPD. Uh, and that is in some ways to be expected. Okay, so I'm going to pause there again um, and uh, see whether anyone's got any questions that they'd like to ask related to that particular area before we move on to intraventricular hemorrhage. So CJ, we have got uh, quite a few questions. So I'm going to start with Tisit Jayatunge, who's from Sri Lanka. So he has specifically asked about uh, use of steroids, when you would consider them in the context of BPD, uh, whether you'd consider steroids early and late, and whether gestation influences that gestation. I mean, obviously, over 26 weeks, fewer babies have it, but under 26 weeks, you know, what role would gestation play a, a part in that? Uh, so uh, a, a very interesting question, and I think an area where practice is changing over time. If you if you think back to sort of 10 or 15 years ago, our use of steroids was very much influenced by uh, some of the, the, the earlier stu the studies that showed uh, poorer neurodevelopmental outcomes in children who had postnatal steroid use. And certainly, you know, some of the that population studies that I showed you seem to suggest that children who had postnatal steroids uh, tended to have poor, poorer neurodevelopmental outcomes. I think it was very difficult to tease out whether that is because the use of postnatal steroids is reserved for those children who had more significant lung disease and therefore more at risk of developmental outcomes. In terms of our practice, um, certainly I think we, we've become less reluctant in our use of um, steroids in uh, managing the lung disease. We certainly don't use early steroids. Um, and I think as a group, we're still unconvinced by some of the the studies of using uh, uh, sort of what are called physiological doses of steroids in the first week or so of life. We would very rarely, if at all, use steroids in the first week to two weeks of life, um, hardly ever, I think. But certainly we are uh, starting to use steroids a little bit earlier than we used to in the past. Uh, and certainly after the first two weeks of life in children who are still on significant mechanical ventilation uh, where we've had uh, the difficulties extubating them, um, or um, in um, children who are still having significant amounts of oxygen and quite brittle on their non-invasive support. I think from a personal practice perspective, it's an area where I think that, that even our own data when we sort of pull it and look at it, it's gonna be quite difficult to, to interpret. Uh, mainly because our, our ventilation uh, strategies and practices have changed over the last couple of years. Uh, one, we're certainly using non-invasive ventilation um, a lot more vigorously than we used to in the past. We've also changed the, 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 the machines that we use to provide our non-invasive ventilation. So uh, until a few years ago, we used predominantly the, the flow drivers to provide BiPAP. Uh, I've never been a particularly big fan of using flow drivers for BiPAP. I don't think they're hugely effective. Um, and, but in the last uh, year, 18 months, we've started using 
um, the servo and ventilators to provide our by, by, uh, non-invasive ventilation, which is, I think, a far more effective way of providing it. Um, and with that, I think we're starting to see that we're extubating our babies and successfully a little bit earlier. We also seem to have slightly more strategies in terms of keeping them off the ventilator when they're struggling. Um, we've also started using uh, NAVA um, as a both an invasive and non-invasive mode of ventilation. I think it's you know there, there isn't a huge amount of neonatal experience in using NAVA, and so we're still very much finding our feet with it. Um, our experience with NAVA is that I think for the really small babies uh, in the first first period of extubation, use of NAVA doesn't seem to stop extubation failure, but Certainly with the more mature babies with established lung disease, um, it does seem to be beneficial in keeping them off mechanical ventilation and also in getting them off mechanical ventilation. So steroid use has certainly gone up um, and uh, we, we are using it a little bit earlier. I think the other challenge is that with that increasing survival that we've seen um, in this sort of 26 to 28, 29 week group of babies and also improved survival with conditions like NEC, we are certainly seeing more significant lung disease developing. And so the, the need to use something like steroids uh, has also sort of gone up. So it's very difficult to tease out uh, which of these reasons has led to our increased use of steroids. Um, but our experience of using steroids in that sort of less than 28 week group of babies is certainly higher. For babies about 28 weeks and certainly about 30 weeks, I think the use of steroids is, is still quite rare and quite unusual. Uh, and more of the time we manage with different non-invasive ventilation strategies. I have a question from, uh, this is a question from Priscilla, who's a Kenyan uh, neonatal trainee. And she's asked about use of hydrocortisone and would you consider it to prevent BPD as is used in the Premilog study? <clears throat> um, the simple answer is no. Um, we've um, had a number of discussions about this over the last couple of years. Um, I think it's fair to say that that as a team, we 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 have felt less convinced by the data, um, and uh, we're also concerned about some of the, the longer term effects of it. Um, and so, as a consequence, we have not uh, um, started using hydrocortisone uh, in in our younger babies as a prophylaxis. That's really helpful. Uh, the other question, so this is one from uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, who's one of our MTI trainees. Uh, just in terms of uh, use of azithromycin, and my experience is I've used it a lot, but I don't know if it works, but yep. Uh, what's your opinion? Yep. Uh, also very good, good question, Abhijit. Um, I have to say, I, I, I'd never used azithromycin as an neonatologist as much as I had used it when I was in Southampton. Uh, and I've never used it again to any significant extent. Um, the, the, the data on azithromycin is still, I think, quite unclear. Um, and um, th there's still, you know, there's a significant amount of concern about uh, the effect of changing your, your gut microflora in terms of not just um, significant uh, things like NEC, but actually the, the things that we don't see like immune modulation and so on. And, and we know that the gut bacteria are extremely important for uh, immune modulation, for recognizing what is food, what isn't food, development of allergies, development of conditions like diabetes, but also as I was saying, some of the more uh, recent work looking at um, gut bacteria and their influence on the enteric nervous system and brain uh, development and maturation as well. So I think you know, when you use uh, antibiotics uh, for unclear benefit, you have to be really quite cautious. So we've we've I mean, we've not used it. Uh, we, we rarely, if ever, use it from a from a uh, from a lung uh, disease modification perspective. But we we are well, We will be participating in the Aztec trial, which is looking at this question because we think it is an important area to explore. Uh, but one uh, where we, which, which needs to be explored as part of a controlled trial as opposed to uh, the sort of free-for-all use that sometimes we see in, 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 in neonatology. That's really helpful, CJ. So those are the questions related to chronic lung disease. Your audio is just breaking up a wee bit. Uh, 
Okay, let, that might be to do with where my speakers are. Is that any better now? That's perfect. Perfect. That's perfect. perfect. Good. So, um, as a, a sort of a, a, a last uh, topic in terms of conditions, we'll talk a little bit about intraventricular hemorrhage, and then we'll try and bring all these three topics together into this issue around uh, prognosis and uncertainty with prognosis. Um, and I'm, I'm sure everyone on this uh, on this chat. Um, uh, Aware of what intraventricular hemorrhages are, what the what the causes of it is, uh, and how we how we define uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. Uh, I think, again, my experience is that it is easy to define when you look at pictures or when you try and put it into words. It's sometimes a little bit more difficult to define when you're looking at a cranial ultrasound scan and trying to see whether something is 50% or less than 50%, uh, and whether the brightness that you're seeing in the ventricle is a hemorrhage or isn't a hemorrhage. Uh, but what is clear is that it is quite a significant problem. Uh, you know, grade one IVHs are seen in about 48% of babies uh, who have were born early. That comes down to about 20% for grade two, uh, around sort of 15% for grade three, and again about 20% for what tends to be called grade four. But I'm I'm not a huge fan of the term grade four, uh, and I've, I've put this picture up uh, deliberately to talk about this word of extension of hemorrhage into the surrounding parenchyma, I, I think increasingly, um, that, that, that's a belief that a lot of people have, but I think increasingly there's a recognition that uh, this terminology is probably better, but it's not an extension, it's a parenchymal involvement or periventricular hemorrhagic infarction. The blood isn't leaking out of the ventricle into the parenchyma, it's a different mechanism of injury caused by venous congestion, et cetera, that causes infarction of the, of the parenchyma. Um, it's, a, it's a significant problem because there are significant complications associated with it. Um, and, and what we've so shown is that actually, although improvements in neonatal care have been quite significant, it's still quite a significant number of babies, although probably slightly less than it was in the previous cohort, who develop uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. And, and still about one in fifth of those babies that have significant intraventricular hemorrhage end up needing uh, a surgical interventions such as a, such as a shunt. Uh, so it's still a very, fairly significant condition. Um, there are a number of different thoughts about how uh, you get uh, the, the IVH. Um, the, the first and probably foremost is a disturbance in cerebral blood flow. Uh, and that can be caused by a number of different factors such as hypoxia, hypercarbia, um, severe acidosis, uh, asynchrony between the baby and the ventilator, severity of respiratory distress. Although I think that severity of respiratory distress probably causes fluctuations in cerebral blood flow through ventilation and hypoxia related issues rather than anything else. Significant PDA and, and, and ductal steel of blood. Um, Interventions such as suctioning of airway that might have an effect in terms of blood pressure, et cetera. And then also rapid changes in pH, which we know has an impact on cerebral um, vasodilatation and vasoconstriction. I think this is probably something that, that we see less now. Um, certainly there's been a, a, a move away from the use of bicarbonate in, in neonatal, neonatal care, uh, mostly due to uh, a number of studies showing that it, it really does not change outcome in any, any significant way. Other reasons for uh, disturbance in cerebral blood flow, things like high, uh, high venous pressure caused by things like pneumothorax, mean, high mean airway pressures, potentially difficulties in delivery, although that's a little bit more contentious, uh, rapid fluctuations in blood pressure. Again, I think my experience is that hypotension on its own or hypertension on its own doesn't tend to cause IVH, but a rapid fluctuation in your blood pressure, uh, either by a child becoming sick very rapidly and their blood pressure dropping very rapidly, or often, I think, uh, intervention. So a child who has significant hypotension for whom we then rapidly infuse IV fluids or use inotropes very um, uh, rapidly, which then can cause uh, significant rapid rises in blood pressure. And that up and down movement of blood pressure is often more of a problem. Uh, and then some of the things that we can't control, such as uh, the physiological instability that comes with, from being a very small baby. Um, the, the fragility of the germinal matrix, uh, that's possibly due to immaturity, but also things like sepsis and, and hypoxic insults can make it worse. And then of course, some of, the, some of the problems that we see with thrombocytopenia and DIC associated with sepsis, uh, 
uh, prematurity, growth restriction, uh, infections such as CMV. So all of these things can cause, uh, cause IVHs. If you sort of look at uh, all the various uh, reported studies, I think there are sort of um, a number of things that have been shown to increase the risk, decrease the risk, or have no impact on IVH. So increase the risk of IVH, uh, the need for residual transfusions, rapid volume expansion, using uh, intraventricular thrombolytics, which I think is quite unusual these days. Uh, but I think this one is, is sometimes under-recognized, but the, uh, uh, the presence of an ascending Gentle, gentle tract infection or, or evidence of significant chorionitis, these children often tend to get uh, more significant intraventricular hemorrhage and more rapid progression of their IVH following birth than children where that isn't present. There are some things that, that don't seem to affect the presence of IVH, uh, inhaled nitric oxide, anticonvulsants, prophylactic surfactant use, early use of corticosteroids. None of these seem to particularly improve IVH. And then there are some things that do tend to reduce the risk of IVH, uh, antenatal steroid use, and potentially the prophylactic treatment of PDAs, although this is also a little bit contentious. Um, so I think IVH um, is one of those things that, that, that I think we can improve uh, the uh, incidence of through good early neonatal care and certainly improvements in respiratory care over the last few years um, from my own experience, I think we're seeing far less significant IVH. We do seem to see quite a significant amount still of uh, grade one and grade two IVH. And, and, and those who work with me at St. George's uh, often, you know, there's a bit of a joke that, uh, that every child at St. George's, uh, regardless of gestation, seems to have grade two IVH. Uh, and, and, and there is sometimes, I think, a little bit of an over-reporting of grade two IVH uh, using that um, definition of there being irregularity of the choroid. And my own personal theory on this, which is which is very much just a personal theory, and I don't think based on any fact, uh, is that our ultrasound machines have become better and better and better. And, and things that we thought were smooth structures in the past are probably not naturally particularly smooth structures. And so we, we see this irregularity in a lot of different things. But in terms of short-term outcomes of IVH, I think we've, we've typically always felt, um, and I think it is still the case that lesser grades of IVH, grade one and grade two, are typically benign in the short term. And, and, and a number of studies have borne this out. But at the higher grades of IVH, grades three, grade four, or, or your periventricular hemorrhagic infarcts, do tend to be associated with more significant short-term problems uh, and medium-term problems uh, with uh, a greater mortality. Um, so 30% of babies are born at around 22 weeks. Uh, if you have sort of significant IVH, uh, you have um, a, a greater than 10, uh, about a tenfold rise in significant IVH. Uh, and of those, about 15% end up needing shunts and quite a significant proportion end up dying as well, uh, especially so with the grade four IVH. What's more difficult to, to tease out from some of those studies is where you have grade four IVHs, um, are those babies dying because they're, they, they're physiologically too unstable and unable to survive? Or are there active decisions being made to, to limit intensive care because of the expected poor outcome? And I think that's a little bit more difficult to tease out. But again, in terms of short-term outcomes, uh, I think what it's shown is that um, babies who have more significant grades of IVH, uh, whose gestations are less, uh, tend to have poorer outcomes than others. Um, and um, most studies that have looked at outcomes till the age of about two from a longer term outcome perspective, suggest that uh, if you have grade one or grade two uh, IVHs, you have no long-term sequelae. And I put long-term in inverted commas there because I think in the lifetime of a child, two is probably not something that you would consider long-term, although in many neonatal studies, we consider this as a long-term outcome. Uh, and I'll come on to some longer term outcome studies in just a minute. But uh, by the age of two, if you've had a grade three or a bowel lesion, it tends to be associated with higher rates of uh, cerebral palsy, cognitive impairment, et cetera. Now, I've, I've deliberately uh, not uh, opened that Pandora's box of starting to talk about cystic PVL um, and uh, periventricular uh, white matter changes. Uh, again, because uh, those tend to have poorer outcomes, but also, um, it's difficult to tease out um, 
what where periventricular hemorrhagic infarction uh, ends and you have a different condition that causes your cystic PVL, there's probably an understanding that these are probably a spectrum within the same and your intraventricular hemorrhage is grade one to three are probably a slightly different mechanism of injury. So I think there's a, there's a really good paper that came out uh, earlier this year uh, from uh, Australia where they looked at uh, a very large cohort of children born between sort of 1991 and 2005 um, and looked at uh, around 550 survivors who were born under 28 weeks gestation and, and matched them to children who had no IVH and also term bo uh, born controls who would have been born uh, at the same time as the expected dates of delivery for the babies that were born prematurely. Um, and I think this, this table, which is quite busy, and I'll, I'll, I'll encourage you to go and read this paper because I think it's a, it's a very well-written paper. It looked at uh, some of the, the longer term uh, functional and motor um, uh, abilities of these children who were born um, prematurely and who had IVH. And uh, what it shows is you've got a group here without IVH, a group with grade one, grade two, grade three, and grade four IVH. And what it shows is that, you know, with the exception of grade four IVH, um, certainly grade one and grade two IVH from an intellectual ability perspective, there isn't a significant difference between grade one, grade two, and not having IVH. And, and this is what we've all um, felt for some time. If you also look at executive function, which is more assessed by parents, similarly, uh, there isn't a significant difference between grade two, grade one IVH and uh, no IVH. But what's also quite interesting is that if you look at grade three and grade four IVH, there is no difference there as well with uh, no IVH. But when you start looking at things like uh, academic skills, uh, grade one, grade two, again, no significant difference. But certainly once you start having grade three and definitely grade four IVH, you start to see some differences in academic skills as measured at the age of eight uh, at school. But what is really interesting is looking at motor dysfunction. And what this shows very clearly is that uh, children with grade two IVH and above, and certainly grade three and grade four, do have significantly impaired motor function compared to children who didn't have IVH or who only had grade one IVH. Um, and this is quite important because a number of studies previously have suggested that children with grade one and grade two IVH, as assessed at the age, age of about two, don't seem to have significant motor impairment. And, and this very well-conducted uh, population-based study seems to show uh, differently. And I think this is an important thing to uh, ensure that parents are aware of. Um, so I'm going to stop there with, with outcomes from IVH. Uh, I think we could talk about outcomes from IVH for quite some time. And, and certainly you could dig into uh, multiple different uh, outcomes, but um, uh, I don't think time will allow us to do that. I'll take any questions that might arise, and then we'll go on to some of the difficulties with, with the prognostic uncertainty. So, uh, Sita, we've got a question from Dr. Jay Sunge uh, from uh, Sri Lanka. So he's asked, if you decide to treat uh, grade three, grade four IVH, say after the IVH is stabilized and you have uh, ventricular dilatation, what is your modality of treatment? Do you consider therapeutic lumbar punctures first or would you wait for the VIs to exceed 95th centile before you actually intervene? And there's a lot of controversy around the worry that you keep having periventricular ischemic infarction with the dilatation and that waiting for that centile might be too late. But just what approach do you have in George's? So I think that's a very good question. And I think there's a, there's a lot of concern about um, the fact that we, we are waiting too long to intervene. But equally, um, the um, the success of things like lumbar puncture is not always very high. In fact, I think our own experience with lumbar punctures is that uh, they can be quite challenging uh, to get adequate amounts of fluid out. And, and, and a number of children, this is uh, non-communicating. So it's very difficult to get the fluid out through lumbar punctures. And then of course, if you start thinking about other interventions like uh, intraventricular traps, those probably do come with more significant um, uh, sequelae from the intervention itself. So our neurosurgeons at the moment uh, tend not to intervene unless uh, you are above the 95th centile and, and significantly so. And uh, 
we don't just use ventricular index, but we also look at uh, head circumference measurements and the, the rapid rise in head circumference uh, is, uh, is often used uh, alongside the, the ventricular indices to decide on when to intervene. We also look at how the child is doing uh, overall uh, and how stable they are from an intervention perspective as well. In a child who is doing well from a respiratory perspective, who is feeding well, who is neurologically behaving very well, then and, and, and whose you know, sutures are, are able to separate and, and the head circumference isn't growing particularly and the ventricles look reasonably big but stable and increasing, we, we tend not to intervene. We, the in level of intervention also varies depending on the age of the child. So the younger they are and the, and the, uh, and the earlier uh, post hemorrhage uh, this is happening, the, the greater the likelihood that even a shunt uh, would fail. Um, and so again, the surgeons tend to be a little bit circumspect about intervening um, and would only consider if there's significant evidence of compromise as a result of this. Whether that, that, that affects a long-term outcome, I think is, is, is much more difficult to say. There, there are, like I said earlier, there are certainly some studies that seem to suggest that uh, developmental outcomes are worse if you wait longer. Uh, but that isn't uh, that hasn't been borne out in every uh, study, and there are some that seem to suggest uh, that it it doesn't matter. The other problem, of course, is that uh, once you put a, a, a VP shunt in, uh, shunt failures tend to be not uncommon in the younger groups. And once you have a shunt, then uh, things like uh, ventriculitis and a shunt infection often has a significant impact on long-term outcome as well. Uh, so it, it, these, these interventions in themselves are not necessarily without significant uh, ability to affect your long-term outcome. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's again, much like with the NEC and surgery, it's often a, a, a discussion between neurologists, neurosurgeons, and the neonatal team as to when is the right time to intervene. That's really helpful, Ciro. Uh, one last question that we'll take. Uh, so Abhijit has spoken about so interventricular hemorrhage is obviously something that we consider quite carefully in terms of grades, uh, potential outcomes. We do follow-up scanning. Uh, what about cerebellar bleeds? There's some evidence coming up that cerebellar bleeds might be as important. And that's something that we focus much less on. Uh, we've started doing transcerebellar views now through our mastoid views. So just your thoughts. I, I think that's a very, very important uh, question. And I think if you look at the Australian experience as well, that study that I just uh, showed earlier, uh, that was from an era where uh, the scans were predominantly uh, through your, um, 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 uh, your anterior, um, uh, the, 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 uh, anterior fontanelle and, and, and did not involve scans looking through the mastoid, looking at the cerebellum, et cetera. Um, we still don't uh, do the mastoid views very much, uh, principally because um, the level of expertise in interpreting them is, uh, uh, is not quite there. But we do selectively do it if um, the, uh, the normal sort of scan would suggest that there's some cerebellar involvement. Um, I, I think this is probably an area that we're gonna see a little bit more on in the future. The other thing that, that also from is important is there's, there's probably a degree of under recognition of more punctate white matter injury as opposed to the sort of more, uh, what we call sort of periventricular leukomalacia, but more punctate areas of, of injury. And there have been certainly some interesting MRI studies recently that have shown that even where you have lower grades of IVH, but you've had more punctate white matter injury available, uh, visible on MRI scans, that has correlated with uh, some of the poorer, poorer long-term outcomes as well. So I, I think this, this area of, of neuroimaging of these babies will become uh, more of an area that we look at. Um, you know, there are, of course, some significant practical challenges for uh, most neonatal units, even in high resource countries, if we started to do, do more MRI scanning, for example. That's really helpful, Sijo. Uh, we're happy for you to ca carry on. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, so, um, in, in, in trying to sort of um, introduce this question of, 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 of prognostic uncertainty, I'm going to describe to you a child um, that we currently have on our neonatal unit. She's a little girl who was born at 26 weeks gestation, one of twins. The other twin died at uh, 20 weeks gestation in utero. Uh, 
Um, she was born at 530 grams, so growth restricted. She got antenatal steroids and magnesium, uh, but it was delivered because the mother was developing worsening PET, Dopplers were deteriorating, uh, and there's clear signs of the baby being, of, of having an abnormal CTG in utero at 26 weeks as well. Uh, following birth, it was, was extremely unwell in the first couple of days. Uh, by day three of life, was uh, already established onto high frequency ventilation, nitrate, multiple doses of surfactant. Um, and despite attempts to extubate, never really managed to successfully extubate until about day 93 of life, so 39 weeks post menstrual age. Uh, and, and a really interesting course with NEC had a perforation on day 13, which was found to be perforation of the duodenum. Uh, got repaired, uh, came back, got a bit more stable. On day 20, had a further perforation, went back to theater, found to have what looked like a transected duodenum and maybe some other areas that looked a little bit dusky. Again, got repaired, came back, uh, and on day 42, had further perforation. Um, and this time, because of the, the, the sequence of events, uh, was managed conservatively and parents were counseled about the, the poor prognosis, but actually rallied, became physiologically more stable. And by around sort of term, 40 weeks of age, had managed to come off PN. Is now about uh, three months post term, um, is still on significant non invasive respiratory support uh, in around 30 to 40% oxygen, has had about two or three courses of steroids postnatally. Um, and is not growing particularly well despite being on full enteral feeds. So I've, I've, I've given you a story there. And what I'd like you to do if you can is use the same Slido polling system uh, and just have a look at these questions. You can choose as many or as little of these options as you'd like. Um, and I'd like you to tell me what you think are, are likely to be the outcomes for this child. So I've got one person who thinks the child's gonna have significant BPD, uh, but is likely to have good or acceptable growth and intestinal function in childhood, but has a high risk of motor, cognitive, and executive function problems and an overall poor quality of life. I'll, I'll give people a couple of minutes to see what other people uh, think, and then uh, we'll move on a little bit more. So what we start to see is that most people think that this child will have significant BPD and post-discharge complications, and, it, uh, and everyone seems to think this child will have a high risk of motor, cognitive, executive function problems. Um, about half seem to think that the child will have significant growth or intestinal failure. About half think that the quality of life in childhood is likely to be poor. Um, although that seems to be improving as time goes. Um, about a third seem to think that the quality of life will be sort of acceptable. Um, and about a tenth seem to think that there might be a high risk of motor problems, but likely to do well cognitively. So overall, I think most people are thinking that this child is going to have quite a challenging um, childhood, but not everyone thinks that it's all doom and gloom for this child. So I suppose a question that, that arises, which you know, we've had a number of conversations about this child would be, if we think these are the kind of problems, and if we think that this child is going to have a poor quality of life and has significant problems long-term, why are we intervening quite so vigorously in a child like this? And, you know, of course, by the time you're sort of three months post-term and you're on full feeds and you're on some respiratory support, it's very difficult to intervene in a different way. But, uh, you know, this, some would definitely have asked the question, as, as we did many times, uh, around that sort of uh, three weeks of age when you had the third perforation uh, in 100% oxygen. Is this the right thing to do? I mean, what, you know, this child is likely to have a very poor outcome. Why are we continuing to provide intensive care? I think this, this comes to the question of, of the uncertainty in the prognosis. So, you know, even where we have... Um, uh, good data about prognosis, and I've shown you a number of studies which seem to tell us quite a lot about the prognosis, 
all those estimates still carry a degree of uncertainty. And by its very nature, when you talk about a 95% confidence interval, it's expressing variation in the outcome of babies with, with similar health conditions and the limitations that are enforced by the sample sizes. And even when you have those prognostic indices, they're not necessarily always tested in these sort of very heterogeneous clinical conditions. Yeah, we look at BPD, we look at NEC, we look at IVH, but we don't necessarily have the numbers to be able to bring all of those conditions together to be able to provide those sort of long, uh, very specific outcomes. And even where we do have very specific information, so for example, the NEC, uh, I think most of you know, everything that we've seen so far today would suggest that if you have three perforations requiring two surgery, uh, and still on PN at 90 days of life plus, you have a, a very high likelihood of, 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 of death or, or poor outcome. It's very difficult to extrapolate from that population level uh, estimate what is going to happen for that particular child. So as an example, even if I had something that said, you have a 30% risk of death with active care, it won't be clear whether this particular baby is one of the 30 who will survive, so who will die, or one of the 70 who will survive. You simply cannot know either of those two until either the child goes home alive or the child dies because of a complication. So that's the, the sort of uncertainty that we have to deal with. And if anyone thinks that that is a, a new concept brought about by the advances in technological care that we have, uh, in 1950, one of the fathers of medicine, William Osler said, you know, medicine is a science of uncertainty and the art of probability. So this is this is really nothing new. Although uh, some of the uh, antagonists for some of the technological advances that we make in neonates say, uh, you know, often say that it is technology that is causing some of the challenges that we face at the moment. And within that uncertainty, there are some other sort of typical, uh, some other sort of significant features. There's um, from a clinical perspective, there can be a lack of familiarity with the necessary or the available information. Uh, the relevant information may be unavailable to a particular clinician. Uh, the clinician or others may be unable to assess the impact on that particular patient or disease characteristics uh, and the outcome of one versus another treatment strategy. But equally, we can have a poor understanding of what the patient or the parent's preferences or priorities are because we focus so much on what the studies tell us about the physiological parameters that we don't ask the patients what, what their view on some of these, these characteristics such as, such as mortality or mobility might be. And of course, we as doctors ourselves can be the source of this uncertainty. So a number of studies have shown that, that doctors vary quite widely in their ability to provide patients with, with clear explanations of disease processes that are intelligible to individuals who are not medically trained. Indeed. Uh, I have to say I have sat with colleagues who have explained things to families that I myself have struggled to understand. So even if you're medically trained, some some people just don't have that ability to explain things in a in a in a, in a clear way, and, and and that is not necessarily because of of a lack of skill, but because of the complexity of the information that we're trying to to condense into one conversation. There's also this difficulty of 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 trying to stay up to date with the rapidly expanding developments and, and novel clinical insights. I think even in a, in a relatively small field such as neonatology, it is very difficult for any of us to keep on top of all the papers that are coming out, but also being able to critically appraise what you read and, and, and look at whether that applies to our practice. And because of that, it can be very difficult for us to distinguish between where there's a deficit in our knowledge as opposed to the actual limitations of the medical information that is available out there. So all of these things bring together the, the uncertainty that we have when we approach some of these problems. And when you look at how that plays out in practice, if you look at uh, some of the surveys of doctors themselves, uh, where you have clear guidelines on how to practice at the extremes of, of gestation viability, uh, even with the sources where guidelines are available, there's considerable differences in practice in terms of initiating and the extent of resuscitation. And even where people had, had asked families about what their views were and what kind of treatment they wanted for their child, at say 23 weeks of gestation, um, uh, colleagues from Southeast England found that uh, 
45% uh, of, of doctors would resuscitate even if the parents wanted comfort care. And at 24 weeks, or about a half would provide CPR and adrenaline despite some guidelines recommending that you don't. And at that time in Southeast England, the guidelines did very much say that at 24 weeks, you shouldn't provide CPR or adrenaline. And, 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 and that's not just an English thing, the same, same thing has been shown in, in, in the US where the clinicians would resuscitate against parental wishes if treatment was considered to be beneficial to the patient. So it does seem like um, the clinician's own personal beliefs do play an important role, even where we recognize that we want to have shared decision-making with parents. And then of course, the next question is, well, if we allow parents to have more of a say, and if we listen more closely to what parents say, um, what affects how parents make a decision? And one, parents often struggle to, to recognize a lot of what we say to them, and their recollection of what we've talked about to them is often quite difficult. Um, and many parents don't even recollect having discussions about um, uh, things like palliative care. And actually, when you when you ask parents uh, what what really was important to them in that discussion, things like predictions of, of morbidity or, or death weren't really central to parental decision making. And what actually seemed to make more of a difference to parental decision making wasn't necessarily the information that we were giving them, but their pre-existing characteristics, such as their religion, spirituality, hope. Those were often far more central to parental decision making than the information that we give them. And so again more of a reason why it's important that we get to understand the families we're looking after rather than simply throwing a lot of information at them. And, and, and this has been borne out uh, also in some of the sort of hypothetical studies using uh, a study where adult volunteers were told about hypothetical deliveries of a 23 week baby and they were then randomized to either receive information that resuscitation was a default uh, mode of care or comfort care was the default mode of care. And those who were told that resuscitation was a default option tended more often to opt for resuscitation. And if you then sort of changed how you framed your prognostic data in either a negative or a positive way, so to say that 70% you know, um, of babies survive being a positive way of framing the data as opposed to saying 30% of babies died, which is a negative way of framing the information, it's still the same same outcome. It's still 70% survival, 30% death. But how you frame it meant that if you got um, uh, got framed the information in a negative way, you are more likely to choose comfort care than if you frame the information in a positive way. So how we as clinicians deliver that information makes a difference to families. And of course, how we deliver that information may often be influenced by our own experiences. So if you've had a, a run of 23 week babies who have died uh, quite significant, painful, challenging ways, uh, you might go to parents and say there's a 30% chance of death as opposed to a 70% chance of survival. Whereas if you've just seen in clinic in the last couple of weeks, a number of 23 weekers who look like they're doing really well at, at, at two years, you might be in a more positive frame of mind and, and, and present the information as 70% of babies survive. So that then begs the question, how do we deal with this uncertainty and how do we try and make decisions within this uncertainty? And in a, at a very simplistic level, we can, we can say that um, uh, you can establish thresholds. You can say that there is a threshold below which uh, not doing something is a harmful decision. There's a threshold above which uh, you can say that that is the best care and providing that care about there is the optimal decision. And then that area of gray in between where we have uncertainty is called the zone of parental discretion. That's the zone where we don't genuinely know what is the best thing to do. And so we rely more on parental discretion. Now the reality of course is that that zone isn't a uniform size. Um, as the level of prognostic uncertainty increases, the level of uh, discretion that we should offer parents increases. So where a particular prognosis has got a high degree of certainty, an optimal decision is often uh, very, very obvious. Uh, and if it's very obvious, that zone of parental discretion is very narrow. So let's take, for example, 
a baby at 26 weeks or 27 weeks of gestation, where in the UK uh, at 26, 27 weeks gestation, we would expect the vast majority of children to survive, probably above 70 to 80%. And we would also expect that the vast majority of those children would have a fairly significantly good quality of uh, life long-term. Also, the numbers of children who have NEC, who get uh, severe lung disease, who may have um, long-term com com complications as a consequence is not insignificant, but we expect more babies to do well. So in that circumstance, if a parent tells you uh, in the delivery room that they don't want you to resuscitate their baby, they would like you to offer palliative care to their baby, I think most of us would feel uncomfortable. We would feel that actually not offering resuscitation for that child is a harmful decision. The optimal care for a child is to provide intensive care. And so that zone of parental discretion is quite narrow. Um, and what we may then say is, well, we'll offer intensive care. And if the child develops significant complications from it, that zone of parental discretion may then widen up. So if this child at 26 weeks, then on day three of life develops uh, severe septicemia, uh, uh, intestinal perforation, has got a grade three intraventricular hemorrhage, is now on significant respiratory support. That threshold that says that continuing to offer intensive care is the best standard may be significantly lower. And you might actually say that providing intensive care now is starting to cause more harm. And so that parental decision not to provide intensive care is no longer as harmful as it was over there. And there's more uncertainty about the prognosis. Therefore, that zone of parental discretion becomes wider. And at this point, if the parent says to you, I don't want you to provide surgery, uh, and if the child deteriorates, I'd like to stop intensive care, you might be more willing to follow that parental view because that zone of discretion that you were willing to give the family is a little bit higher. So how does that work out in practice? Well. We always encourage shared decision making. So what that means is we as doctors don't make the decision on our own. We don't make, ask parents to make the decision by themselves, but we have a dialogue which allows us to make a shared decision. And I think it's really important that we recognize that this is a dialogue. It's not that shared decision making is we dump a whole bunch of data in front of the parents and say, please make the decision. Do you want me to offer your child surgery or not offer your child surgery? That isn't shared decision making. That's passing the buck in a way. Shared decision making means that we have that dialogue and we work together to come to a decision. But of course, that sharing of medical knowledge is, is dogged by the imperfect nature of the knowledge and the complexity of, of the information, which means that it can be very difficult for us to understand, but equally difficult for us to share that information impartially. And of course, the, the quantity and complexity of information, even if we present it perfectly, may be quite challenging for, for families to understand. And that's why, from my perspective, the best practice for me now is more is less about trying to provide huge quantities of information to parents and having that sort of one-way dialogue of providing parents with information, but actually starting to have that relationship with families where you make significant efforts to understand what the parental values are, not your values or expectations of what uh, a child needs to have, but actually what are that particular family and that particular parent's values for this child and their hopes and desires. And you then integrate that with your clinical experience to, along with the information that you give parents, provide them with a recommendation for the care and an explanation of what you have used to come up with that recommendation. And when you say what you have used to come up with that recommendation, you don't just talk about the clinical information that has allowed you to come up with that recommendation, but importantly also to tell them, my feeling or my understanding is that for you, a child with significant, a child who's got a risk of significant disabilities is, too high a risk for you to take. That is my understanding. My understanding is also that for you looking after a child with a tracheostomy or with uh, um, a significant uh, need for parental nutrition going home, 
would be an unacceptable quality of life for yourself and for your child. And on that basis, I make this recommendation or alternatively say, my understanding of is that you are willing to care for this child. You have made it very clear that the level of disability is less important than the child being given opportunity to um, experience life in whatever form it comes. And provided that I don't think this child is going to have significant pain and suffering as a consequence, then on that basis, I, I have suggested that we do X rather than Y. So in some ways it is slightly directed counseling, but as long as you've had a conversation with parents beforehand and they say that they would like you to help them with that decision-making, then I don't think it's that paternalistic kind of decision-making that we had in the past where without any of this conversation, without any of this desire to understand the families, we simply went to them and said, your child has got X condition, the treatment should be Y, and this is what I think you should do. And I think in a way, from a lot of the feedback that I've had with families, what families really struggle with is the emotional burden of decision-making being left almost as if entirely in their hands. And, and, and in some ways, this lessens that emotional burden for families. So for me, it feels like this might be a way for us to explore um, that sort of shared decision-making in a way that allows families to have a real say but at the same time having the benefit of that expertise that you have uh, in helping them to make a decision. Um, so I'm going to stop there um, and come back to any questions. And what I might do is I'll, I'll stop sharing the slide so we can see, see everyone. So I'm gonna ask if anybody would like to directly interact with Dr. Cedar Francis uh, with any questions. Looks like I've either stunned people into silence or managed to get everyone to sleep. I think Cedar, I'll be really honest to say that was an absolutely amazing talk in that I think the approach that you've provided to us clearly recognizes that what we've got to do is be very careful with putting the burden of responsibility with parents by giving them too much information, expecting them to make decisions. And one of the concepts that we've discussed in previous talks is the concept of what we call as facilitative paternalism. We're not really being paternal. We're giving them all the information, but we're making a judgment about whether they are capable or want to make that decision or whether their expectation is that we support them through it. And there might be some families who actually feel we are the experts and that we should be making that decision to guide them. And uh, I think it, you know, you're know you absolutely right to say that we've got to individualize that to every family. We've got to make that judgment. And uh, what we've got to do is it's kind of shepherding them through what are very, very difficult decisions where they have got information which is informed, which is accurate, as accurate as we can do in, in the face of uncertainty. So I think an absolutely fantastic talk. Uh, lots of thank yous. So very comprehensive, uh, a fantastic approach. Thoroughly enjoyed the session, brilliant lecture. Uh, great wealth of information. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, end the, the session here, but before that, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, CEO. I mean, I always learn and, you know, even at the stage of my career, I think I'm continuing to learn. And I mean, this was an absolutely amazing talk. I'd like to humbly thank uh, CEO for taking time out to actually prepare what was an absolutely fantastic, very comprehensive presentation, covering a lot of the morbidities that preterm babies suffer and giving us an overview or an approach of how we might want to actually do that. Thank you, CEO. Thanks, Alok, and thanks for this uh, opportunity, but also thank you very much for organizing these, uh, these fantastic sessions. I think there's a there's a lot that we learn from each other from these uh, from these sessions, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm I'm glad that you found it useful. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye.